Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to class this morning. <laughs> no, this is always an experience. Uh, good to have you all with us this morning. Uh, those who are uh, classes, I guess we're having teachers this morning, so things are kind of getting a little bit back to normal. Um, Susie went through her surgery well. She's recovering, so I uh, did a little better with this one than the last one, but still uh, going through the process of recovery. So uh, she's doing she's doing good, though. Really appreciate the prayers, the thoughts on her behalf. Um, is there anything else that we need to mention, particularly this morning? Anyone knows that? Everybody's happy, huh? Boy, can't beat that. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day you've given us, for this time to come together to look at your word, Lord. We're thankful for Susie's surgery going well, for her recovery. We continue to pray for that. For others who are sick, Lord, and suffering, pray that you'd be with them and help them, Lord. Thankful for the blessings of this life, that you'd be with this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, we're in First Thessalonians, and Buck did the other night on First and chapter 1 and 2. And You know, the question really is, why did Paul write the letter? You know, what was it about, um, you know, what was the deal in Thessalonica? You know, what had happened? And a lot of that has to do with, you know, Acts. When he goes in there on his missionary journey, you remember, right, he went to Thessalonica, and there was a lot of opposition raised up against him, and he wound up going to Berea. And, you know, he, that opposition still existed when he left. And so he was worried about the church there because of that opposition. You know, he wound up going to Athens. So he went to Athens and he was worried about that opposition that was remaining. How was the church doing there? What was going on? Of course, this wasn't in a day you could just, you could just send out an email or make a phone call. You had to send somebody to figure out, you know, what was happening. And so that's, so Paul did that, and he sent Timothy, and this was his response. We'll kind of see that today. So he had sent Timothy to them to say, how's it going? What's going on? How's everybody doing? And he was waiting to hear that report back. And then when he got that report back, then he writes First Thessalonians. He writes a letter back to him in response to that, in response to that uh visit of Timothy. So it says, therefore, we could endure it no longer. We thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. Now, that's kind of a thought, you know, what does he mean by that? Does he mean that it was only him that was Athens? Because if you remember the story, right, he, they was, uh, Timothy and Silas stayed in Berea, and Paul went to Athens. And then Paul sent, he says, as soon as you can, you need to come to Athens. So, then he, he says here, he says, we thought it best. We could endure it no longer. We thought it best to be left behind at Aslan. So there's some speculation there. Did Silas stay with Paul? Is Paul talking about him and somebody else? Of course, we don't know. But he was in Athens at this time. And then he says, we're, we sent Timothy to basically to go up and check on you. Now, Timothy, there was some... You know, Timothy, if you, if you look at 1 Timothy, there was always a little bit of this, I guess, discussion about Timothy being so young. Timothy was half Greek. You know, Timothy's the one he had circumcised to get the Jews to accept him. So Timothy, it always seems like Timothy had a credibility issue. You know, Paul was always really behind him, and Paul seems like always had to build up Timothy's credibility. And I think it's kind of the same thing here. He says, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel. So he always kind of builds Timothy up. Paul... Paul said Timothy was his son of the faith or child of the faith. So, you know, Timothy was really dear to Paul and he was a good helper of Paul. And Paul used him a lot, but he always seems that he had to, uh, he always kind of built him up a little bit as to his uh, credentials or who he was or what was going on. So anyway, he's curious, you know, what's going on up there? So he says, well, let's stay in Athens because Paul didn't want to go back up there because that caused the problem in the first place. They came out against Paul. Everybody was against him. And Paul was thinking, you know, if I go back up there to Thessalonica, then 
then you can almost hear the discussion, you know. Well, I want to go. Well, yeah, but you probably shouldn't go. You know, if you go, you're going to cause trouble. There's going to be more persecution. It's going to cause them more trouble. But I want to know what's going on. You know, you kind of got to put yourself in place of what's going on, you know. Paul's like, well, I want to know what's going on. And Timothy's like, well, here I am. Send me, right? So Timothy, so, you know, so Timothy decides he's going to go. So Timothy takes off to go. And Paul's still in Athens, and maybe Silas is still in Athens, but there's some debate. Maybe Silas is not in Athens. Some people think that Paul sent Silas to Ephesus, so, you know, we just don't know. But he wanted, he said, no one can be disturbed by these afflictions, for you uh, yourselves know that we have been destined for this. These afflictions he's talking about was this controversy that ensued about his, uh, you know, about what was going on, and because of that, the persecution that was against them, and the persecution against the way, and the Jews were stirring that up. So these afflictions were going on, and Paul says we've been uh, destined to do, destined for this, for we were, when we were with you, we're telling you that we were going to suffer, and it came to pass. For this reason, I can endure it no longer. I sent out to find out about your faith. So two times he says this. Paul says, I've I can endure it no longer. You know, I needed to know. I needed to know what was going on. I needed to know what was happening. I couldn't, couldn't endure it any longer. So I sent two times, he, he says this, you know, so you can tell that he was really distressed about their condition. You know, he had started that church. He had planted that church. That opposition arose. He had to leave probably before he wanted to, before he was ready to because of the opposition. And now he was concerned about their well-being. And he wanted, and here he kind of brings Satan into it. The tempter may have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. So Paul wanted to know that what he did still existed, that they were still doing all right. So Paul has sent Timothy to find this out. So that was, that's kind of what this letter kind of deals with. But it's interesting, you know, Buck went through First and Second Thessalonians, and a lot of that was just real encouragement and real you know, this building up and this senior faith and all this. But then when you get down into three, he's like, this is why I did it. You know, I had to, I had to know. I had to send Timothy. Timothy had to tell me uh, what was going on. So there's a lot there, and it really speaks to you about his trust that he has for Timothy. You know, how much he trusts him to be able to go up and to do that and to bring back that word that Paul put a lot of faith in Timothy to be able to do it. Uh, but now Timothy's back. Right? This is what this letter really comes down to. Now Timothy's come back, and Timothy's told him all the things that's going on in Thessalonica, and he's brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, just as we also long to see you. So this is good news, right? Timothy's come up there. He says, you've got all this love. All these good things are going on. Um... You still want to see us. I think that was important to Paul. Because, you know, there's a lot of problems with Paul being there. And they would be like, oh, we don't want Paul back, right? We don't want you to come back. Remember what happened last time you were here, right? You just need to stay away. But they were held up to that affliction. And they longed to see him. And he says, in our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. And now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. doesn't mean that they really live. It just means that it brings life to them, you know, is the idea there. You know what it means. Um, so Paul is ecstatic about the good report that he's got back from Timothy. So the question becomes is if Timothy goes up there and sees them and everything's good, everything's great, everything's wonderful, everything's right, and then Timothy goes back, and now Paul, like, and you, and you get this idea, and we'll see this, so like immediately he's sending this letter back. Immediately he's writing back to them, right? So the question becomes, you know, why do you think Paul was in such a hurry to respond uh, to them, you know, after this? What, you know, why didn't Paul just send a letter up there in the first place and say, you know, how are you doing, what's going on, uh, let me know, send me back, right? Send me back a letter, let me know what's going on. I mean, he, number one, why do you feel the necessity to send Timothy up there? Number two, you know, why is he in such a hurry now? Why does he hurry to write them back, do you think? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, he always inspects what he expects, Buck says. That's right, you know. He wanted to send somebody in case there was problems, right? A letter can't fix problems most of the time. 
And I think Paul was almost expecting there to be issues. And Paul thought, well, if I send Timothy up there, maybe he can do something, right? Timothy could do something. So it's more than sending a letter. You know, I'm sending somebody that can... And I think it's more than that, though. I think Paul cared for them so much that a letter just wouldn't do. You know, he wanted to send someone to them to say, you know, I care about you, and I, and I want to send Timothy. I want to send somebody to you. But then he was in a hurry to respond. He wanted them to know that he really cared enough that as soon as Timothy got back, he was going to send this letter. And, of course, I'm sure it took a while for letters to reach their destination. I'm sure that didn't happen in a day or two. So I'm sure it took a while for that to happen, for them to reach that. So I think he wanted to hurry and write this back so that it could get back to them. He wanted to encourage them. Um, but also I think he, he wanted to address some things with them. Um, not, not big things here, but I think we'll see that. For what things can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? So Paul's very ecstatic, commends them. You saw that in chapters 1 and chapter 2. He commends them for what they've done. He says, day and night we pray earnestly, may see your face, and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now that doesn't mean maybe there were big things wrong there or huge things wrong, but Paul thought they could help them in their faith. What's lacking? In other words, your faith is good, your love is good, but there's always room for improvement is kind of what this is talking about. You know, we didn't complete what we should have done. A lot of ways you can kind of look at Paul in that respect. You know, we had to leave too quick. You know, we didn't get to finish what we started. We didn't get to finish everything that we should have done with you. So, you know, Paul's like, we want to return to you. We want to be able to do that. We want to be able to help you. But um, the Lord direct our way to you and increase you. Uh, you may establish your hearts without blame before God. So it's very encouraging, very uplifting, very much wanting to encourage them to keep the path that they're going. Uh, this building, he talks a lot about their love they have for each other, love they have for him, the love he has for them, very gushy letter, really, right? I mean, it's very much all this that he's really trying to, to build them up and to let them know uh, what's going on. But he says he exhorts, as you received instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel, excel still more. You kind of got to read between the lines a little bit. You know, he's saying... You do it, but he at this other time is saying, I'm encouraging you to do more. You, what's lacking in your faith? Read between the lines, right? Read between the lines. So is everything perfect in Thessalonica? You know, I think you could probably say probably not. It's probably good. It's on the right track. It's kind of what Paul wants to see. But everything isn't as good as maybe it should be. Paul doesn't want to discourage them, but he's saying, okay, I think the part of this is uh, what, how to walk and please God. There's really no parentheses in Greek. It's what's called, but it is a parenthetical statement. In other words, it's one of those things, it's like what we would use parentheses, it's like we're backing up and kind of inserting something in there. So he says, uh, the instruction, how you should walk, but he says you excel still more. So you know the commandments we gave you by the authority, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. So, <clears throat> you know, letters are about problems. you got to remember that in the Bible. Letters are predominantly about problems. They encourage, they exhort. But letters address things. So Timothy's been up there. Timothy sees what's going on. Timothy comes back, tells Paul. Paul writes this letter. You've got to put yourself in that place. So Paul now, he's bringing up some things. Paul's always big on that. He really builds them up, builds you up, tells you how great you are, just like we do, right, with people a lot of times or sometimes with our kids. 
we try to give them a lot of positive, right? And then and we get done with the positive, then we tell them maybe what we really want to tell them, or we tell them what they ought to, what we want them to hear. So, you know, when you read these letters, you kind of got to think like that. So <clears throat> he's encouraged them, he's built them up, he's talked about love, he's talked about all these things. And now he says, you know, you're walking this way, but you're lacking a little. Uh, you need to excel still more. So it kind of gives you the idea, yeah, there's some things going on. And then when he gets down to this will of God in three, uh, sanctification. What does the word sanctification mean? That's right, set apart. To sanctify means to set apart. It's exactly what it means. So in this sentence, he says, your sanctification, which is to set apart, and then he says, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. What does sanctification have to do with sexual immorality? Yeah, but sanctification, like Leela says, means to set apart, right? So put those two things together. So what are they not so what's the problem here? What are they not doing? Yeah, it's about purity. It's about you need to set yourself apart from that. If you're not doing that, then you're in sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality, like in this part of the, in this phrase, in this Greek, it covers everything. It's a broad, that's why it says sexual immorality. It's a broad spectrum. We're talking about all the things that are not really just like you would say sex within a marriage, whether it's fornication, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, whatever, all the things the Bible talks about. That's really what's encompassed in this, in this phrase. So he says you need to set yourself apart. And then Paul says, possess your vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. This is going to get really kind of deep, and you kind of got to read between what Paul's saying because he just doesn't come out and say it necessarily. But he does say it. So he says, you need, Clyde one time talked to me, remember that Clyde, about self-control. Remember he said you had to do something over self-control, and he said, you know, you really can't find the word self-control in the Bible. You know, the Bible doesn't really say self-control, but that's exactly what this is, even though it doesn't say it. This says you need to know how to possess your vessel. You need to know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. So, you know, that's the idea. Set apart. But then it gets a little deeper right here. Because then he says, No man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we told you before, and solemnly warned you. What matter? That no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. What matter? How are they defrauding their brothers? By what? Sexual immorality. Right? So how's that happen? <laughs> right. Adultery. Daughters of, you know, there was a lot of real young marriages, child, teenage marriages. A lot of that was going on. There was a lot of, there was a lot of a, He's talking about adultery. He's talking about maybe what was going in a Corinth where, you know, one man's got his father's wife. I mean, there was a lot. It was, this is a very pagan world. So a lot of that wasn't really, they didn't have that value, that Christ value in that. So, you know, even though he gives them all this good stuff, and, but then he starts to kind of go into that, what's lacking, uh, you know, I'm going to build up what's lacking, that we may complete what we told you. Then he gets into the crux, Right. So when Timothy's up there, <coughs> Timothy's seeing all this too. So Paul's warning them. He's not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. So, you know, sexual immorality, anything to do with our bodies, whether we're talking about an addiction or a sexual whatever, or whatever, it all comes down to self-control, controlling ourselves, Right? The Bible's big about that. Christ is big about that. We need to know how to control ourselves. We shouldn't be animal-like. We shouldn't be instinctful. We should be purposeful and focused. And that comes down to us being able to control our us. And that's probably the hardest thing for us to control, right? Really, is ourselves. And so there's a lot of pull on this. This is a big thing. 
And they're living in a society that condones it to a large extent, just as we are living in a society that condones it to a large extent. Well, it really does condone it, right? So we don't think much about it anymore, let's be honest. You know how many of us watch a TV show? How many of them relationships are what you would call godly, you know? Uh, not many, <laughs> right? You know? So, and we don't think much about that anymore. 30, 40 years ago, yeah, we would have been a big thing. But, uh, you know, the days of my three sons is long gone, right? Uh, and we, uh, and we, we, let, we allow that. We don't think much about it. And so, uh, you know, that infiltrates our society and it infiltrates our thinking. And all of a sudden, as we get along that way long enough, it becomes where it's not that bad anymore. Everybody does it. It's not a big deal. Everybody does it. It's not that bad. And that's kind of what happened here. They're in this Gentile. They're in this pagan society. It's not that bad. Everybody does it. It's, it's a normal. It's what goes on. Um, and then Paul's saying, yeah, but you don't need to be that way. So it's, that was a big deal. Are there any comments? Nobody wants to touch that one, huh? <laughs> you reject it, you're not rejecting man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write for you. So, you know, love is a big theme. Um, and he commends them for that over and over and over. You love one another, all the brethren in Macedonia, but do it more. Make it your ambition. Verse 11 of <coughs> 1 Thessalonians. That's, to me, that's the working man's verse of the Bible. That's always what I call it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. I just think that's the working man's verse of the Bible. I remember when I preached a funeral years and years ago for uh, uh, Frank Barron. I don't know how many of y'all know Frank, but for Sooner. We used to call him Sooner. But, uh, but uh, when I preached his funeral years and years ago, he had a Bible by his, by his uh, nightstand, and he had that verse right there underlined. And I was, that's always stuck with me through all these years. He uh, when he passed away, he had a Bible by his nightstand, and it was open to First Thessalonians, and he had this verse underlined, and that's always kind of stuck with me. Um, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend your own business, and work with your hands. So, you know, Paul basically says, you know, just be a good person. I mean, he's saying, you know, don't get in anybody's way, lead a quiet life, work with your hands, don't be a burden to anyone, provide for yourself. Paul was always big on that, providing for yourself. You know, Paul's the one said, if you don't work, you don't eat, right? So, so Paul was always big on that, providing for yourself, taking care of yourself, lead a quiet life, attend to your own. But I always liked that verse because to me that was just being a good person, you know. Paul wasn't saying to step up and be the greatest thing on earth or he just said, make it your ambition. Lead a quiet life. Work with your hands. Take care of yourself. What's that? Might have been a problem. Right. You know, that might have been part of the problem. A lot of people use the church as a crutch, which they still do today. You know, use it as a way to get stuff or to make ends meet or whatever. So... That might have been part of that too. Paul was always really big on that idea of being self-supportive. So he, so I think he brings that up here, and he, uh, and you know, I think like Buck says, maybe that was another, maybe that was another problem. Um, so those are things there in First Thessalonians four. I often use that verse with funerals, people who work hard all their lives. I just think that's a great verse for that. It tells you that that's a good thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with just being a good, normal person in God's eyes. You know, God's not expecting you to change the entire world. Sometimes God's just expecting you to be to be a good person. You know, <laughs> so and I always I always like that verse. That's one of my one of that's one of my favorite verses in First Thessalonians, and I First Thessalonians for a lot of reasons. But I think it's a great verse, and I, I really like the sentiment that it brings. Behave, pop properly don't be in any need you know paul well like i said that was a big theme of his to be supportive you know paul worked as a tent maker paul worked to support himself when he had support he didn't you know there was times he didn't 
But, you know, most of the time, Paul, when he goes somewhere, he had to work. And Paul, and Paul said that a lot, didn't he? In, in the letter to Corinthians, he says, you know, we, didn't, we weren't a burden to you. And what he means, we weren't a financial burden to you. We weren't asking you for support. And so that's a big thing in Paul's mind. Um, and he didn't want them to be in need. He didn't want them to, to uh, behave improperly towards outsiders or people not in the church. He wanted them to be self-sufficient within their cells. And then I think Paul brings up the bigger, probably the biggest thing that, and I think this is probably one of the biggest funeral verses. I know I use it a lot of funerals, especially at gravesides. But, um, you know, they were concerned. And I think that this, there's a lot in this passage about their mindset and what they were expecting and what was really happening. Because I think people really thought Jesus was going to come back really fast. I mean, they thought that he was going to come back in their lifetimes. Isn't that what he said? You know, you're, many of you here will not taste death till you see the kingdom come. And a lot of them were still looking for that earthly kingdom. A lot of them thought he was going to come in their lifetime, in that time. And the Bible really plays that because, number one, they stayed in, in Jerusalem for three and a half years in the end gathering. They didn't leave. They sold their possessions. They sold their property. They did that because they didn't think they were going to need it. Right? I mean, you just got to really think about this a little bit. They really thought he was going to come back a lot quicker than he did. And over and over, you know, the, Paul and others have to remind them, right? Uh, God's patience towards you, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, you know. Uh, Peter, you know, a day with the Lord's like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord's not slow concerning his promise, right? As, slow, as some count slowness, right? So, they started to have to tell him, that this isn't going to happen in, in a little bit. You know, this isn't going to happen. But, but in the meantime, if you're still kind of looking for that earthly kingdom, you're looking for that stuff to happen, and these people are dying. And the Thessalonians, the people in Thessalonica are like, well, if they're dead, how are they going to take part in the kingdom, right? Now, you've got to understand, there's a lot deeper undercurrent going on here you and I don't have an issue with this because we all believe in the resurrection. We all believe in eternal life. We all believe there's life after this. All Jews don't believe that. Matter of fact, all Jews today don't believe that. I was laughing. I actually was kind of bucketeric by the house the other night, and I kind of threw out this pun. You know, I said, get in a room full of rabbis and ask them if there's eternal life and watch them argue because, you know, they won't agree. I mean, a lot of rabbis will say, you know, there's not. A lot of rabbis will say yeah, there is. I actually listened to a really good uh, uh, little sermon by a rabbi on that, that he had actually went to a, this lady, his young mother, lost her husband, had two young children. She was Jewish. She went to this, she had to drive all the way, a lot of miles, like 100 miles to go find a rabbi. She went to this rabbi and sits down with this rabbi and she says, I really just come to ask you one question. She says, is there, is there She'd been talking to a lady she's a friend with that was Catholic. She'd been talking about eternal life and about heaven. And so she goes to talk to this rabbi. She says, I really just have one question. He says, is there life after this? Is there more than this? And the rabbi says, I really don't think so. My wife does, but I really don't think so. And that was it. He didn't give her any real explanation, anything. He just, well, she, of course, was pretty upset by the whole thing, you know, obviously. So she goes back home and then she goes to this other rabbi and she goes to him and she basically asks him is asking she's she says i'm really upset so this rabbi calls the original rabbi says what are you doing telling this lady the rabbi says i don't know he says uh, you know there's like seven schools of thought on the afterlife in judaism he says uh what do you want me to tell her you know and he says well maybe you could at least tell her one of those views you know and so she anyway so she asked this rabbi she says is there is there life you know is there something after this something beyond the grave and the rabbi she went and talked to uh you know go to the old testament and prove the afterlife i, I dare you to do that uh, you know <laughs> you're going to struggle i mean there's a few places don't get me wrong there's a few places right i mean saul the witch indoor called up samuel right um, Abraham says, I want to be gathered to my people, but you can take that two ways, right? Um, Solomon says, uh, right, 
the soul returns to the dust and the spirit goes, the soul goes back to God. So in Ecclesiastes, that's about it. I mean, I'm just telling you, there ain't much there. And if you're a Jew, what you got to remember is a lot of Jews, like the Sadducees, a lot of conservative Jews, don't really take poetic literature to be, to be real, more or less, or to be binding. A lot of them don't take it to be authority. So if you take poetic literature out of it, you take Job out of it, you take Ecclesiastes out of it, um, you're, you don't have a lot, <laughs> right? I mean, you pretty well, you've pretty well shot that dog, <laughs> right? There ain't much left. So the Jews, even in Jesus' time, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, right? That was a big thought. Even in the time of Christ, that was a big thought. A lot of Jews today don't believe that there's an afterlife, don't believe there's an eternity. They don't believe that. So they believe this is it. Well, you would say, why would you serve God if you think this is it? I don't, wanna, I don't, I don't know the theological implications of it. I'm just stating the fact, right? So... So they don't believe that. So Paul is talking to people who a lot of them don't really, number one, have a great view of eternity. Number two, maybe not, have been taught their whole lives it doesn't exist. So once you're dead, you're dead, right? How are you going to take place in this resurrection when they're dead? Well, that would be a little disheartening, right? You got your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, whatever, they die. You're thinking, they're dead. Christ is going to come, they're going to miss it, right? So you kind of got to think a little outside your box or my box to really get your head wrapped around the whole thing about what's going on. Paul was a big resurrection guy. We all know that. Paul used that in his argument in Acts. He says, I believe in the resurrection. I said, there's some of you here that believe in the resurrection and some don't. He was talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And then what happened? Like I said, Get a bunch of rabbis in a room, ask them through the eternal life, watch them fight. Exactly what Paul did. Got a, bunch of, got a bunch of rabbis in the room, said, I believe in the resurrection, and then they got to fighting, and he just left. <laughs> right? Because, because, they didn't, they, because they don't have that they don't have that answer. It's hard to prove it in Judaism. So, so anyway, it's a little bit bigger thought than what you and I think. Because you and I... We're our whole life have been taught the eternal, about eternal life and heaven and the resurrection. And you and I, we don't struggle with those things. But they did. So they're asking. They're concerned. My mom's died. My dad's died. My husband, my wife, they're died. They're, they're uh, we got to get that clock fit. They're died. They're in, they're in uh, uh, you know, how are they going to take place? So Paul says in this letter, and, you know, really, Paul, two great, two great passages in the Bible where Paul addresses this, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Two big places that Paul really talks about eternity, talks about what's going to happen when we die. You know, Paul really is the only person that really talks about that. Am I right? I mean, there's nobody else in the Bible that really talks much about uh, the resurrection, talks much about... Um, what's going to happen when we die. Nobody really talks about that. I mean, Jesus died and rose, but Jesus, and Jesus says, you know, in John, he says, I'll go to prepare a place for you that you can come and be where I am. But that's about all we get. We don't really get the picture. Paul is the one who really paints the picture of what happens when we die. He really, he really does. So, you know, I, you, that you're not going to find that in Acts, you know. They talk about salvation, but they don't really talk about what's going what's to happen. They don't really talk about where we're going to go or how that's going to work. So we really rely on Paul because Paul's this big resurrection guy. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul grew up believing in the resurrection, right? Pharisees believed in the resurrection. P Pharisees believed in eternity. So Paul believed that his whole life. Paul didn't have to go from being a Sadducee he didn't believe in it to, to a Pharisee who did. Paul always believed in it. So for Paul to make that jump into the idea of Christ and eternal life wasn't a big jump for him. It wasn't a big change in his theology. He already believed that. Maybe that's one reason Jesus chose Paul, chose a Pharisee, instead of choosing a Sadducee. Because a Sadducee would have struggled more with that idea. 
But in Judaism, it's really a controversy. Does it exist? Does it not exist? Is a soul immortal? We don't have a problem with that. But in the Old Testament, you do. One of the great conundrums of the Bible, in my opinion, is some of the shifts in theology between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And from a Jewish standpoint, that's, it's pretty big. It's pretty hard to wrap your mind around a lot of the changes that take place from the old to the new. It's pretty big. So, you know, we often criticize them. Well, why can't they just accept it? Why don't they just see Jesus? Because it is a, it's a big thing. And unless you really look at that, you don't know how big it is. And actually, it's one of the things in my life, in my faith, it's one of the big, it's one of the big things I wrestle with. I'll be really honest. Is I really wrestle with a lot, of that, a lot of that shift. And if I wrestle with it, I can just imagine what a Jew goes through trying to piece that together, you know, trying to make that jump. Because it is a big jump. There's a lot of things in the Old Testament in Judaism, if you want to look at it that way, or in the Old Testament, there's a lot of fundamental principles that you and I so accept in New Testament thought that are really hard to show in the Old Testament. The, old, the Holy Spirit is one of those things. He's there in the Old Testament, but you've got to look. He does, he's not, it doesn't pop out at you. There's places, things, little bit snippets in the beginning and the spirit of the lord moved across the surface of the deep in genesis if you take that out of the old testament the spirit of the lord doesn't really exist in the old testament you got to hunt him it doesn't pop out in the new testament he's everywhere in the old testament don't see it Miracles weren't attested to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the miracles that existed. All of a sudden we get to the New Testament, boom, Holy Spirit's everywhere. Satan in the Old Testament doesn't exist. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that, but I really, it's really true. Satan just almost does not exist in the Old Testament. You say, how can you say that, Rex? He was in the garden. The serpent was in the garden. Didn't really call him Satan. Never really called him Satan, did we? Never really did that. We called him the serpent. And if you want to see Satan in the Old Testament, you've got to go to Job. Or you've got to go to Zechariah, because that's the only other two places. The word Satan never comes up, and it means one opposed to God. We don't really call him. That's not necessarily a proper name. It means one opposed to God. So, was Satan in the Old Testament? Yeah. And in the New Testament Christians, we put him there. We see it. But from, if you don't have the New Testament from an Old Testament perspective, to go to the Old Testament. I was going to do that one one Wednesday night, I said, I'm going to preach Satan from the Old Testament. I worked on that sermon for three weeks. I never could put it together. It just wasn't there. I mean, realistically, it just wasn't there. Um, and, so, and so those terms, those things, all of a sudden when you get to the New Testament, they just pop out at you. All of a sudden you've got Satan and you've got this epic battle over good and evil and you've got demons who don't exist in the Old Testament. Right? I mean, where do they come from, right? Demons that really don't exist in the Old Testament. Now, you could say there was an evil spirit that troubled Saul in the book of Samuel, but it was an evil spirit from the Lord that troubled Saul. That's pretty difficult to figure out, right? And all of a sudden, you've got Satan, and you've got demons, and you've got the Holy Spirit, and you've got eternal life, and the Jews are going, hold on, <laughs> right? <laughs> hold on, I didn't get all that. You know, I didn't get that. And now you're asking me to make this fundamental, this huge jump. And it's hard. It's hard to do. And so that's what's happening here. Is and you and I, unless you really study that and think about it, you don't see it. Because we just take it for granted. Because we've always heard it that way. And we've never had to go to the Old Testament and say, show us in the Old Testament. Show me Satan in the Old Testament. Show me demons in the Old Testament. Show me the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And if you do that, and you go to the New Testament, you're like, that doesn't jive like I want it to. You know, why all of a sudden did all this come up? And I think there's answers to those questions, and I don't mean to, to batter your faith. I'm just telling you, it's something I've spent a lot of hours studying, that shift, that, that shift that happened between Malachi and Matthew. What happened? 
right? So for a Jew to put their mind around that, you can't criticize so quickly. You can't just say, well, you ought to see Jesus. I see Jesus. You ought to see him. You can't do that because it's a huge theological jump to get from Malachi to Matthew. And you're not going to do that overnight. There's questions you have to ask yourself. We don't do that because we were raised New Testament Christians, right? The Old Testament to us, we were our whole lives, I was, and I'm sure you were too, our whole lives we've been said the Old Testament's nailed to the cross. Oh, it's good that it's there. We can learn a few things, but we really don't need it. Really what we need is the New Testament, everything we need concerning eternal life and everything is in the New Testament. That's true. You know, we really don't need that Old Testament. We've heard that over and over and over, but yet the Old Testament is still there. It's still God. It's the same God. We need to look at both things to be honest about our faith because our faith, even though we're New Testament Christians, our faith is still based on the Old Testament. Whether or not we like that, it's true. Without the Old Testament, we have no faith. We have no Christ without the Old Testament. So it's a lot to think about. That's where these people are. I didn't mean to go down that aisle this morning, but... <laughs> what? That's... Right. Yeah, and that's where people always go is Revelation to try to make that the serpent, the dragon in Revelation. And that's about the only place you'll find that. That's the only place you're going to find that connection. But, um, you know, the problem... Uh, let me get to the end of this. We're out of time. I want to talk about that more, but I'll get into that more one of these days. I've spent a lot of hours studying Satan. And... Uh, it's a, it's a lot more complicated than um, I think we know. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, he says, uh, so he tells them, and that's where they're at, and he says, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who have died. That's what that word means. We know that. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. This is probably the most used scripture at funerals. Um, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, but I think the part we miss of this is probably right here in 14. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. I think that's a really powerful statement. Now, you can take that about three different ways. Um, you can take, but I think to take it the way Paul says it, you're talking about Christians, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Don't you think that's what that would mean? Now, there's two ways to think about it. So either he's bringing them back asleep or he's bringing them back awake. Now, if you're a soul sleeper, if you're one who believes in soul sleep, then I guess you think he's bringing them back asleep or maybe he wakes them up right before he brings them. I don't know which way you take that. But if you believe in a conscious soul, then basically he's saying we're these disembodied spirits. Because Paul's big not just on the resurrection, not just on eternity, but Paul's big on the bodily resurrection of the dead right? That he really believes, and that's, and that's what he proposes, and that's, and that's what he really talks about. So he's talking about disembodied spirits. He's bringing back those with him. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, we who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And to really get into this, you've got to go to 1 Corinthians 15 and read about how the body's changed in the moment of the twinkling of the eye, the last trumpet for the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. you really got to get into that, which we don't have time to do. But he says the dead will rise, not the soul. He's bringing them with him. He's bringing the dead in Christ with him, the soul. But then he says we're alive will not precede them. In other words, the dead will be resurrected before the living will be caught up and changed. You've got to put 1 Corinthians 15 with this passage. So the dead will be resurrected, not the soul. The soul he's bringing. The body will be resurrected. How can we take part in the kingdom? Well, the body will be resurrected. It's a physical kingdom, right? We understand that. It's not an earthly kingdom, but it's a physical kingdom. Sometimes we have a hard time making that distinction. We'll have a body. We'll have matter. There's a place for us to dwell, Jesus said. Paul says, you know, while we're in this tent, we long, we groan, longing to be clothed with our earthly dwelling. 
he's talking about a resurrected body, or heavenly body, resurrected body. So he says, for this we say to you, we will not proceed though. So they'll be raised first. For if the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now a lot of people look at this and they think, well, this is talking about the rapture. But it's not. Because we're not talking about, we're not talking about meeting on earth. We're not talk, he's talking about bringing them. This is not talking about a tribulation. People say, well, why doesn't he talk about the wicked? You know, because we don't care. I mean, I hate to say that. Should I say that? You know, the truth is, we don't, it doesn't matter. The wicked's going to go where the wicked go. The, Paul's not writing to the wicked. Paul's not writing to, to tell them what's going to happen pa, to the wicked. Paul's writing to, to encourage what's going to happen to the saved. So you got to look at it. So Paul is saying, we're going to do it. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall always be with the Lord. The Bible says nothing about Jesus ever coming back, setting foot on this earth to have an earthly kingdom. We will meet him in the air. You'll see him come as you saw him go, it says in Acts, right? Saw him go up into heaven. You'll see him come in the air. doesn't say he's going to come back down. He says, you'll see him come, come just like he did. The dead in Christ will rise first. And therefore, we, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So they're worried about it. What's going to happen? They've died. They're buried. How are they going to take part in the kingdom? Paul says, don't worry about it. Paul says he's going to bring them with him. He's going to raise the body, 1 Corinthians 15. He's going to raise the body imperishable, incorruptible. And then those who are alive will be caught up. Read 1 Corinthians 15. will be caught up. Right? In the moment of the twinkling of an eye, be caught up and will be changed. Right? Will be changed, Paul says. So, if you're alive when the Lord comes today, if the Lord come this morning, well, that would sure solve a lot of problems. <laughs> if the Lord would come this morning, then I guess we would see the dead raised and the graves opened and the dead raised. And then when all that took place, then we would, then we would, be lifted from the air and our bodies would be changed and so we'd be forever with the Lord. And what happens to the earth? Who cares? Right? I mean, at that point, it's a done deal. Earth's going to be destroyed with a fervent heat and the elements will be melted therein and we'll have a new heaven and a new earth and there we shall dwell forever with the Lord. And that's the end of the story. We don't need to know any more than that. Anyway, I know I ramble a lot today. Thanks for your time. And we'll be back in a minute. <laughs>